Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union. What's happening with human rights around the world on Think Tech Live streaming network broadcasting from our downtown studio at the core of downtown Honolulu in Hawaii, Moana, Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. And today we're looking at Ukrainian women in the war want peace, fighting for freedom on the front lines. And I'm joined today by Yara. Yara, thank you so much for speaking with us here in Hawaii and around the world. Uh, hello, nice, nice to meet you. Nice to see you here and today. We know that, of course, war has been going on for a long time since 2014 and before, but we know Ukraine held its first Independence Day since the start of the Russian invasion. Could you share what it felt like that day uh, last week? Oh, of course I can. You know, um, uh, the end of the February and March uh, was very difficult for me and for my battalion and for all Ukraine Defense Forces. And uh, that day I feel a great uh, coldness uh, when I uh, had to, um, you know, uh, have lots of sleep in uh, just in the land and in the armor vehicle, inside of the armor vehicle, and it was quite cold winter. And I thought that uh, the summer would never come, truly. And I thought I would never uh, be alive uh, to the summer and to the, our independence day. So the time, uh, I thought I wouldn't be alive at <laughs> the 24th of August. And um, that week ago, uh, I was happy that I uh, that I was lucky to meet that day. And of course, I remembered about the fellows who died the last month and last years. I just wanted to say we're so glad you're alive as well. And we know that women are sacrificing a great deal in the current conflict in the pursuit of peace for the future of your nation. Oh, yes, it's uh, my choice. Uh, you know, I'm not conscript. I am like, uh, I was in contract. I've been in contract for two years. Uh, it's my third year in the Ukrainian army. And it, it was my choice. So I, I, I don't think, think I am a victim or something like that, you know. No way at all. I mean, think you're more brave for serving in the many roles that women do and for you to secure the right of self-determination and the destiny of your emerging democracy in Ukraine. What did you do before you joined? Uh, before I joined, I studied in Kiev in university. Um, I was finishing my master program uh, from literature, literature studies. Uh, and after that, I was um, translator in publishing house. I translated books from English to Ukrainian. And I also were like social activists. So um, we uh, looked through dif different laws that was voted in our parliament and um, democracy and uh, Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian language uh, uh, were very important to me as for activists, and of course, women's rights as well. We appreciate you sharing, and of course, what you're talking about really describes, it's a fight for freedoms, no matter what the challenge is, and it's great to know that you were involved to make sure that the democracy was thriving as well, and exciting to hear about your literature too. Yeah, democracy is very important for me, and you know, this war, um, we fight not only for our state, but for uh, democracy as a yeah, way of living. Because the thing that we have in Russia, that they have in Russia, right? It's uh, um, a country where you cannot develop yourself and where you actually cannot be free. That's why I don't want Ukraine to become a part of Russia. You know? And it's true, Ukraine just celebrated its 31st anniversary of being an independent state, and it really signals a defiance to the Kremlin and its kleptocracy and its culture of authoritarianism. What is it like 
on a daily basis? And, and what could you share with the world who's who's not there on the front lines? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, you asked about my day, day yes, about what, what I what I'm doing here, basically, right? Um, uh, nowadays, my uh, task yeah, is to organize tactical and medical evacuation from positions, uh, from our positions here. And uh, besides, uh, I also uh, pilot drone. So uh, these are the things that I do daily. Mm, I'm also a driver, so I drive uh, my car in different parts of the, the our direction. Many different tasks, whatever is necessary to to make sure that you have your freedom. Yeah, of course, I'm combat medic. So uh, combat medic is uh, in Ukrainian army is almost an ordinary soldier, but in case where there are casualty, there are wounded soldiers, you just give him first aid and help to, to be evacuated. And in case there are no uh, casualties, you just work as ordinary soldier and do ordinary tasks. So I'm, I'm not surgeon, I'm not professional or like medic, uh, just like par paramedic maybe. What are some of the worst and what are the general human rights violations that you see in your work as a paramedic and helping Ukrainians? Um, I helped uh, my uh, wounded fellows uh, when we were in direction near Mariupol city, if you hear that, we were sent there on the beginning of the march, and there we our our company, um, three of us three of us were killed, and we had lots of wounded. Um, well, you know, for me to help uh, soldiers. Well, it's it's my job. I don't feel any like um, bad feelings, you know. It's just my job. Uh, but it was quite difficult for me when I saw a wounded kids. You know, I had an experience in this village that uh, we, we defended this village for a week with a uh, not uh, not big forces you know russian russian forces uh will be were much much bigger at the time so they, they had lots of armor we we call uh lots of artillery and we just uh, like two um platoons yes who should uh, keep this village and in that village i had experience to help wound one uh, boy who was wounded in chest. Uh, that was very difficult for me because, you know, kids, it, it, it's uh, quite difficult even for me as for military. Because, uh, well, soldiers, we are just adult people. We understood what we choose when we uh, went to the army. But not kids, well, and I felt, um, uh, well, and anger and hatred towards Russian, what they do with our civilians in Ukraine. That was uh, uh, the worst experience for me. Of course, ex apart from that, it is very difficult to, um, uh, very difficult to survive situation when you um, cannot evacuate your. Uh, killed uh, fellow from the battlefield. You know, in this active war, not the, the one who killed. It's very difficult to live with that because then uh, his uh, parents, his uh, um, just relatives, ask you. Where is his body? And you, you just must explain that you didn't have ability to do that because of the bottom. It's very hard thing for every soldier in war. No, it's it's brutal. 
and we thank you for sharing and giving us some insight to what it's like being a soldier fighting on the front lines there. What is, if there is anything, the most gratifying and important part for you to participate in this fight? Uh, you mean um, what, wh why I participate in this, right? Yeah. Uh, so what 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 you mean? Uh, what were my reasons to participate and to jo join, yeah. right? Yeah. The the what motivated you, and then what's the most important part you feel today? You know uh, about motivation. A uh, very important thing that we have no choice if we want to live in democratic state. If we want to come back to our homes, my home is in Kiev, in the capital of Ukraine. We have to fight because if we would not fight, uh, we would be occupied it for few weeks. <laughs> I think so. Uh, so the motivation is coming back home in your free home. This is my main motivation. Um, I chose to uh, sign contract in 2019 because I understood that there will be the second uh, hot phase of this war that Russia is going to attack us again as in 2013. And I wanted to be ready and prepared to this moment. And um, 24th of February, I meet with my uh, like uh, platoon. We were, we were ready. We, 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 did, we did what we ordered, uh, what we were ordered to do. Uh, but there are things uh, on each war to which you will never be prepared. You, you must understand that Ukrainians, uh, we we peaceful nation. We would never start war. We would never, uh, we don't want war. We want to develop our country and our you know, um, business and other things. But uh, you see, we have no choice. It's not we who started this war. No, and I'd been to Kiev as well, and we did a human rights training there, focusing on the sustainable development goals and also looking at uh, the important issue of the emerging democracy. And I think what you were sharing about as well, what you participated in, the nonviolent revolution to make sure that your government was on the right path towards peace and and democracy for all people in Ukraine. Uh, yeah, I, I was also, uh, I, I participated in the revolution in 2013, and that, that was the revolution of values. Uh, of our, cho our choice to uh, join this uh, like, European Union and European values. Uh, not, not to be, you know, post-Soviet state, of Soviet state and autocratic state. It's very important uh, choice in my life, this revolution. No, and, and I remembered when uh, the invasion of Crimea took place, many people saw that as the beginning and that the response was not rapid enough by the world so that unfortunately we find what did take place on February 24th of this year. Uh, yeah, uh, you see, Russia and Putin, they hoped that this time they took lots of territory the uh, same way as they took Crimea, you know, that we just, uh, Ukrainian army will go, will leave uh, these uh, regions, but, you know, I always say that um, Putin and Russia, they never, um, never learned the history of Ukraine. <laughs> they they uh, think we don't deserve to be a state, and that's why they don't know our history. Because if they uh, learned uh, our history, history of Ukrainians and Ukraine, they would know that we never give up, by, by the way, that we always 
fight for us, even if we have much, much less forces to defend us. That, that was always in our history. No, I remember being there on a, a very cold day, and I remember the one square that's at the bottom of the very long hill, and the ice that forms, and the people's will just to make it, no matter how cold and how icy the hill was, people would still make it up that hill. And of course, from Hawaii, we're not used to ice like that, but you could just see the indomitable will of people in Ukraine, but also the love for life and culture as I was able to go throughout the streets of Kiev from the opera house to the cafes. And I definitely hope for you that you'll be able to enjoy Kiev again very soon. And when we look at now what's going on, we know there's a new offensive that's starting and it's looking to try to focus on the southern part of the country, looking at Kherson. Do you feel that that's moving in the right direction and that we might be able to reverse that space? Mm, I don't so, of course, I hope that we uh, will take her son back, but of course, um, we will have much losses. You know, I, I am, as a, as a military, I understand that uh, to uh, back her son and the south of Ukraine, we should pay with blood. You know, we should pay with blood, and we have lots of. Uh, <clears throat> weapons and we are, we are really grateful to the USA and to the European countries for weapons because I see I see these weapons here on the front line and they they have already changed uh, the um, uh, you know the way this war uh, goes here you know uh, Russians, uh, they're afraid of these uh, weapons that we got from US. And it helps us to save uh, the lives of militaries and, of course, the lives of peaceful uh, for civilians. That's yeah. probably the most valuable words that we could ever hear. And we appreciate hearing from you on the front lines what is needed the most, but also what do you think the world can do to help? looking at this conflict six months in on the latest wave, but also since 2014? Uh, I think, um, at first, uh, the, the world can give us weapons. This is the first thing that, and uh, the first thing that uh, all countries can do, and that's very helpful. And the second thing is not to forget, not to forget about this war, because, you know, in uh, modern world, uh, the memory uh, is very short, you know, in the world of social media, the memory is very short. Uh, the wars and conflicts, they look just like one, you know, one phrase in the news, and next day you don't remember this. And it's very important for Ukrainians that you and the whole world won't uh, forget about our fight for democracy. This is very important. And I believe if we uh, got much weapons, much this um, uh, cannons, you need, you need uh, cannons and long distance artillery, if we got that lots of that, uh, we will be able to back our territories and to stop uh, Russia, I think, and to stop for uh, for long for a long time. You know. This war is very devastating for well, um, very hard for them as well. So they underestimate us. You're, it's, it's beautiful to see your bravery, and we appreciate all that you're doing. As you said, it's out of necessity for the love of your nation and to make sure that the people of Ukraine have a country in the future. Uh, when we look and we hear from you directly, it allows us to definitely never forget. You, you don't need to worry about that. 
but I, I do appreciate your sense of understanding the strategy of what needs to happen with what we face today, that when the lens of CNN or the world media might shift, that people would forget. But we can see now, six months in, that many people, Ukraine is still on their mind, but even larger in their heart. And people are working and standing in solidarity with you. And we appreciate you taking the time, especially so late, and also being able to find a safe space to be able to share with the world directly from the front lines what you're facing on a cold evening there and what's going on from the front lines where people want to know. And we appreciate you coming on today to giving us an insight into what you're, you're seeing. Just uh, support, uh, support me and trust. I I think if you could just speak up a little, I missed that last part, but I'm trying to hear. Uh, um, maybe I, I don't catch you again. The, the connection is quite weak here. I, I'm I I don't hear all the words that you say here. Um, no problem. Mm, we we appreciate yeah. you making the time. About message, right? From here, yeah? yeah okay. Well, mm, just, uh, I don't know, stand with us. Uh, remember that one, one, one death, the death of one civilian and the death of one soldier, um, it, it, it is a war, you know, and he, right now here in uh, Ukraine, Russia commit such crimes that are so, so, so weak and so great that it's difficult to, 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 to conceive them, you know, to, under, to just to believe that it's possible in this century. <laughs> yes, and um, I hope... Uh, that in the future, you know that the lives of Ukrainians, uh, they will be uh, more mm, mm, protected than, than it was before 24th February. I, I hope so. I hope for this uh, solidarity from all, all the world and from us uh, for that. Well, there's definitely a couple of things that we can share. And that first and foremost is there are many lessons of the global community standing together in solidarity and acting more quickly than ever. But what you're also sharing from the front lines is, is the weaknesses of the world system and how we have to make sure that we strengthen the rule of law and human rights so that no one's rights are denied and that no other woman or child or person would have to face what you're facing on a daily basis now in Ukraine, that we could end the scourge of war forever. Yes, that, that would be great conclusion of all of that. Yes, but um, the, the truth is, uh, doesn't matter in what century we live, yes, and what, how it develops is our civilization. Um, there will be, uh, there always will be someone like Putin who just uh, want to check it, you know, and uh, to destroy it, by the way, and we, we should be prepared. And oh, of course, our experience, I understand, is very, well, is very um, valuable, that uh, this war is something different that had, uh, you know, I think, uh, other countries, for example, it's very different from Middle East, Afghanistan, because this is, this is, uh, this war is like World War II, this, uh, I know, great amounts of armored vehicle tanks. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> No, it's true. And actually, on this date 
1146, the European leaders outlawed the crossbow and they were hoping to intend to end war for all time. So as you share, we do have to see what's possible and what direction we need to go in in the future, but that we have to look at some of those deeper issues maybe that you were looking at in literature. Did you have a favorite literature that you enjoyed while you were studying that might provide a lesson for humanity going forward? Mm. Um. I know lots of Ukrainian literature, but I'm about this. You know, or uh, if you um, if you're interested in Ukrainian literature, you will find uh, that uh, there are lots of uh, texts about fight uh, and about fight for themselves. And um, well, let me let me remind the author. For example, Milan Kundera, if you know such writer, uh, he's a Czech, Czech-French author, and he wrote a lot about uh, this, um, uh, how totalitarian regime is changing uh, country, changing personality. Um, this is about invasion of Russia to Czech, uh, Czech Republic in uh, 1968. Yes, and uh, right now I'm reading his novels from Milan Kundera. And uh, yes, uh, I admire the senses that he found. I admire his novels for a great, uh, great freedom of personality. Uh, that is the main value. And the great freedom of personality, you know, this, without any measures. Uh, as the same thing which is forbidden in Russia. <laughs> no, I, I hope you are able to continue reading and continue your studies very soon. And I'll definitely look up that author. And I also love the writing of Vaclav Havel and those amazing people who also use the word as the most powerful weapon to change what they find themselves in to make the world a better place for all. And we hope we can share your words tonight with the world and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.